You know I'm right. The podcast that uncovers the origin stories of some of the biggest names in sports, media, entertainment, entrepreneurship, and so much more. Nick Durst here along with Joe Calvary. And Joe, our guest today, it's an interesting story how we ended up getting him. We actually met him through some events and some other past guests, but that's the deal here with You Know I'm Right. We're all family. Everybody's all attached to the You Know I'm Right brand. Yeah, absolutely love that. Uh, it's currently a performance coach, author, dynamic public speaker, tech visionary and thought leader, according to his website. Um, uh, but he, his bread and butter is with talent, working with talent, uh, connecting people. Uh, he's got a background in real estate too. So we'll get to pick his brain there. Uh, very interesting cat and a fellow Paisan like me. Uh, so we welcome Mike Chiraco, better known as C-Rock to the show. Mike, we love the studio. We appreciate the fact that you decided to stay there uh, and be there uh, while we're recording this episode, man. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, fellas. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. You know, uh, I couldn't remember if Joe, you were going to be on my show today or if I was going to be here, but I've done so many damn shows that uh, I can rock either way. So I'm, I'm excited about this because I've been doing a lot of interviews myself and I'm, I'm ready for a little bit of a break. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that later. Let's, a little roll let's of get here. So ready to go. Uh, how are things in Ocean City? You live there. You do, your amazing family, your wife, your two children. Did you grow up in Maryland? Did you grow up in Ocean City? How'd you end up settling in Ocean City? Yeah, things are great here, by the way. The summer just ended and Labor Day passes and it starts to, to wind down here. And uh, they did actually start doing a uh, festival here called Ocean's Calling. It's coming up in October. And they have five bands, uh, five stages set up on the beach. And then they uh, decided this year to keep them up for another couple of weeks and have countries calling right after that. So it's pretty, pretty exciting times here, Ocean City and seeing the growth here for, you know, small rural beach town. But uh, I'm ready to get out. I'm ha- actually heading to L.A. Uh, next Friday to take a new show that I'm starting called That One Podcast with Mike C-Rock on the road and um, going in actually in studio live because uh, it, it's, it's about time for that. I'm, I'm excited. So. But yeah, man, I uh, I played football in college, and there was a small college, Division three school called Salisbury, mm-hmm. and uh, I ended up going there for football, and I, I grew up outside of Philly, and uh, met my wife down here about what maybe right at right right before September eleventh, two thousand one, so whatever twenty three years ago, and settled here, man, and I you know what's cool, fellas, is that I get to live in this small town and do what I do still, working with celebrities and big name entrepreneurs and authors and speak and all that, but live in this small town. But my wife was cool. She's like, Hey, you know, I want to live by my family. And if you have to travel, I won't give you any shit. So, <laughs> so I was like, all right, cool. So I live in this small town here and, but I get to, you know, get out and travel quite a bit. Nick is the, uh, the happily married man between the two of us. I'm still the single one. So as they say, happy wife, happy life. Uh, quick question. You said you grew up outside of Philly. Uh, where does your sports allegiances, you know, where are they? Are they in Philly or are they closer to Maryland, D.C. area? I'm not a big sports. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I, I'm a huge sports guy. And unfortunately, when, you know, I think you got, everybody knows this, and no matter what town, whether it's Philly, New York, it's kind of one of them things where you don't really have a choice. You're born into it. Yeah. And so I, I'm an Eagles fan, man. I'm Philly everything. I, I believe green, uh, red and green right now. And, you know, I get it. And I'm not one of those jerk off uh, Philly fans, though. Uh, I, I'm not like the stereotypical guy, stereotypical guy. I like to have fun with everybody. And, but I love my, my teams and I root for them. And um, I've been through times where it's ruined my week when they lose. <laughs> and, but now I'm not like that anymore as much. You know, I, I realize that they don't pay my bills and I just watch it for entertainment and watch my son uh, go through his journey now, his sports fan journey. Um, so, yeah, man, Philly all the way. Yeah, I I, I got I feel a similar sentiment. You know, I used to like be all about the games, like it, it would crush me if my team lost, but less than my like they say in uh the Bronx tale, you know, like these athletes don't care about you. They're not gonna yeah. pay your bills. So it doesn't it doesn't you know, now that I'm a family man with the with the wife, the kid, like it doesn't uh it doesn't impact me as much anymore. But also maybe I'm just numb to it as of late because my teams have been awful for the last yeah. five, six years. Yeah, I went, we went through our streaks, obviously, in Philly, where every, you know, there wasn't really much to look forward to, except for opening day or first game. And then, and then it was there from there. It was just complaining all the season. 
Um, but you know, on that note, it's interesting. Um, James O'Keefe just came out with a report of uh, commanders. I don't know if you guys saw this, but a commander's employee uh, hidden video. They do these hidden videos and usually it's most of the time political and what have you, but this was a content person, VP of content for the commanders. And it kind of goes to your point where they don't really care about you, yeah. but he was, he was exposed and of what his thoughts were of the NFL, the team, the players, it's pretty bad, but it just goes, kind of goes to show that the, it's a, it's a corporation. They're trying to make money and you're the, you're kind of not the product, but you're the uh, consumer, you know? The ownership situation is always a flux down there. You're going to own a team someday. Hey, I'll never, I, I'll never ever say never to anything like that. Well, I just said never, but uh, I can tell you this actually. I was, uh, I have some friends that were putting some money together to purchase the Commanders and try to bid in on the team. They didn't get it, obviously, but I was, uh, you know, I went to dinner in DC with this group, and it was an interesting, diverse group. And um, I wasn't necessarily going to put money in to have the ownership, but there was something there. I, I didn't, I had no idea how I even got there, <laughs> but. <laughs> You know, when you start getting out there and building a brand and meeting and networking with people, it only changes, you know, one person takes one person to change everything for you. So I'll never say never, man. Absolutely. All right. So let's get back on track. Uh, you mentioned you attended Salisbury, right? You played there. Uh, you studied economics and, and finance, right? So kind of going along what we said earlier, you know, when you were younger, what did you kind of envision for yourself, you know, as you were getting older, what kind of career path? Uh, and when you were there, did you ha do any internships or did you partake in any programs that kind of helped you along the way? Well, I, on paper, I majored in those things, right? That's what dictated the classes that I was supposed to go to. Um, I dropped out of college with a 4.0, though. Uh, I had 13 classes left. Um, I, I think I really did major mainly when I got to college. I came from a small town uh, outside of Philly, right? And um, when I got to college at Salisbury, the first thing I said was, holy cow, look at the variety and number of girls <laughs> i'm just i'm just gonna tell you like it is fellas and then the party scene i didn't drink until i got to out i graduated high school i didn't party much i was focused on football and school and when i got there man it was uh no holds barred and i was it was all about where's the next party where can we hang around some girls and um i kind of lost focus so really my college life was really focused on that and that's what really kind of ended my football career because i was you know, there was times where I'd be out late at night. We'd have practice the next day during the season. I wasn't really starting. So uh, we'd be going through walkthroughs pre-practice and I'd find myself and we'd take a knee and I'd find myself dozing off at practice. I'm kind of embarrassed to share this, but um, the fact of the matter is that's, that's what it was, man. And, uh, you know, I dropped out and went into sales. And uh, actually I was working in the restaurant business first while I was in college. And I, when I dropped out, I was still working in the restaurant business. And I thought, I, I, yeah, I don't know if you guys seen the movie Cocktail, Tom Cruise's movie. So I watched that movie a bunch of times in college. We, we watched the same movies over and over again. And I was like, man, that's an awesome dream to eventually go to the Caribbean and be a bartender, maybe open up a bar. And so that's what I was kind of thinking. And uh, I don't know why or where, but then eventually I got into sales and just started making some money from there. But Yeah, so those are the in-between blanks, the fill in the years uh, from when you graduated college, I see uh, on your profiles until you kind of started going into to real estate a little bit. Um, quick point, uh, that movie came up over the weekend when I was with my friend Jordan. And it's very interesting because it was like never brought up to me before. And it's now been brought up to me twice in the last four years. Weird. Yeah. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, stars, yeah. It's written in the stars. You see, Nick, they call that a synchronicity. Yes. He's, so Nick, Nick is like over the years, I've been trying to like beat it into his head. Like this stuff is real and it exists. And very, very, very slowly, he's starting to pick up on it. Uh, Sirach, what would, how would you describe that? You know, just quickly before we move on. Well, I mean, I look, I study quantum physics now. I mean, I've come a long way since those days of chasing women and parties. And, uh, you know, I study quantum physics, man, and I understand how science works and it's true. I mean, everything has energy and these wavelengths resonate with other wavelengths and they also repel from other wavelengths that don't resonate with them. So uh, there's a, there's something there for sure. I don't know what that means though, Joe, uh, why somebody brought up cocktail besides myself. I don't know what that means for you, uh, but <laughs> but it, it's real. Yeah, no, it's real. Yeah, they're just a crazy coincidence, even though we we all know that there's no such thing as coincidences. No, right. No. So let's talk about you moving into uh, the real estate world, right? Uh, branch manager, mortgage consultant for Universal Mortgage. 
uh, finance and branch manager, division partner for Nations Lending, right? Uh, so a couple questions here, you know, packaged in here. Uh, your experience living through the 08 financial crisis, you know, uh, the lead up into what happened and then the fallout kind of what happened after. Uh, and from your experience, uh, your knowledge in, of the business, you know, what have you seen change the most overall in the real estate market over the course of, we'll say the past, you know, 15 to 20 years? Well, I was in in-home sales for nine years, cut my teeth on closing deals that night at that that house that we were in sitting there for two or three hours showing somebody a product and, and closing them. And I noticed uh, I was watching the real estate market. I bought a house back then in 90, what was it? 98. I bought a house, my first house, I think for $92,000. And so I started realizing that, okay, this real estate thing uh, is not as scary as I thought it was. There's a lot of things that go on in our lives where we don't have knowledge and we get, we're, we have a fear towards it. We have a, it repels us because we don't know about it. So when I started realizing how it worked and I started watching the real estate agents and I started factoring in their 3% that they were getting or whatever it was back then, three and a half percent. And I was like, wait a minute, that's pretty good money. I can do this. So I decided to get my real estate license. And very quickly because of my, my hustle and work ethic and my, the things that I learned in in-home sales really translated well to the real estate game. I became a quick uh, number one you know, seller and, and listing agent. And I did it for one year before I decided to transition into mortgages because I had some friends that were in the mortgage business and I didn't really like showing people houses. That wasn't my cup of tea. Um, so I, I started looking into the mortgage side and seeing how, how much they were making and generating. And, and I realized, wait a minute, I want to, I want to investigate this. And so I ended up getting into the mortgage business, get my mortgage license. And, uh, I'm the kind of person that gets bored pretty quick. So I just, from there, after doing some loans and making really good money, I uh, decided, okay, what's next? And the next thing was, okay, how can I lead a team or manage a team and build? And so over the, the next, I don't know, 10, 15 years, I started to build branches and build a team. And I had branches with my partners from Delaware to Miami. And we had hundreds of employees over the years. And, you know, we, we got up to eight figures and was, you know, was thinking, how can we get to nine figures? And during 08, I was still a loan officer. This is prior to starting branches and, and, really operating in, in a, you know, an organization, um, this, to speak on the 08 thing, I really didn't know what was going on. I had a pipeline of loans and, uh, all of a sudden we found out that where we were placing these loans as a broker, we were a mortgage broker. They weren't going to close those loans. And here we had promised these people, these loans, and they weren't going to close. So we had to figure out where we're we going to send all these loans. We had all these loans in the pipeline, which is our revenue. And it was a mad scramble. And it was like an, Oh shit moment, right? Like, what, I've never been in through this before, but one thing about me, fellas, is I'm a problem solver. Like, uh, you know, I, I got to figure out, okay, when something's happening, okay, what do we got to do to put the fire out? Everything else comes to a stop. All the other things you were focused on and worried about, it's like, okay, how can we stabilize? And how can we put the fire out? And when you do that, and, and you're the type of individual I am, your emotions go up, not down. And when your emotions go up, everything always works out. So you, your emotions go up to higher state and you're like, okay, put the fire out. What's, what's the first thing we need to do to, to make the situation better? Okay. So we got to find homes for these loans and, and, and save as many of them as we can. And so that's what we focused on in 08. And after that, the team that we had at the time, I wasn't really managing, but the team shrunk. They had licensing requirements, which came out, which you never really had to be licensed in the mortgage business or go through the training that you had to do pre-licensed training. That came out, that uh, eliminated or disqualified a lot of people that were working in the mortgage industry. So talent became scarce. And at that time, we were, we were thinking, okay, we're well, loan officers, we're making X amount of money. How can we increase our margins as a loan officer and make more money than we're making now? And that was to open up our own branch. And so I had no idea anything. I, guys, I, I'm, when I tell you this, when I commit to something, I don't know what the heck I'm doing. I don't know what I'm going to do. Like, I just commit. And it seems like every time I do that, the how always appears. And so eventually, uh, obviously there was mistakes and we, and we lost money doing some things because we didn't know, but eventually we started to figure it out and we started understanding how the back end worked and we started recruiting, we started building. And uh, I think we opened our, our first branch in 2011. And from 2011 until 2000, uh, well, I mean, till, till just about a year and a half ago, I was in the mortgage business and we built branches and we were making you know, anywhere between 12 to 15 million a year and having a lot of success. And then eventually when it came down to, I guess it was 2018, I started realizing that I was coming home miserable and I felt conflicted because the money was so good. 
And I thought I was doing everything I was supposed to do. Finally, I made some good, like good money, man. I had money to invest and spend on things and provide a good life and nice house here on the, on the water. And, but I would come home miserable. And I was like, what is this? I, I'm, I'm so conflicted here. But the fact of the matter is I just wasn't fulfilled. It wasn't in alignment with my purpose. And I had to figure out and go through some soul searching to figure out what I wanted to do the rest of my life. I was in my four, early forties and I was like, I can't do this the rest of my life. And so I came to this conclusion that I had to get known globally. And the reason I thought that is because now I figured out the regional thing. I was on magazine covers and regionally and television and all that. And I realized the importance of attention, but I figured if I got known globally, it would create what I would call an attraction model. You see, I was in my a chase mode my whole life. Starting when I got to college, I was chasing girls, chasing parties, got into sales, chasing sales, chasing revenue, chasing employees. And then I just, you, that's not sustainable. So I figured if I got known globally for being a performance expert, knowing how to scale businesses and build brands, I could have opportunities flowing into me, people flowing into me. And then that creates a new problem, a higher level problem, which is now I got to figure out what to say yes to and what to say no to. And that's good. I mean, it's a good, a whole new problem. And so that's what happened. I had no idea again, when I committed to get known globally, I had no idea how to do it. I was like, this commitment's here. And, I, and you start to panic a little bit. You're like, I don't I have no idea what I'm doing. So I started watching people that were doing what I call manufacturing celebrity. People like Ed Milet, Grant Cardone, Tony Robbins, Gary Vee, watching, watching what they were doing. And I was like realizing what they were saying was very interesting to me. But I know a lot of the stuff. I have had a lot of experiences. I got a lot of stories just as good as theirs. But they know something that I don't know. And there's a game being played behind the scenes. I don't know the rules to or how to play the game. And I got to figure this out. So I started studying these guys and getting them to some other organizations, buying some of their stuff just so that I could have access. And then I started watching and realizing, oh, okay, I see how this is played now. All celebrity, all celebrity is manufactured. And I just need to manufacture celebrity. And so uh, I went on this journey of uh, getting known globally. And uh, yeah, and that's what, that's what the start of it was. Well, I wanted to talk, you know, about the mortgage rates being awful right now. I think you got it at the right time, but you know, you're talking about these people here, all these 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 people that I consider maybe to be frauds or scammers. Uh, what do you think? Is is, is that type, is that type of you know preachers? To, oh, let me post a million reels. That's is that is that a Ponzi scheme? Like, what is it that these people do that have people you know worshiping them or living on every word or being like? Listen, I mean, maybe I don't have a lot of money, but I want to start a business, but I'll go and spend 10000 to go see this guy speak at his conference. What is it that these guys, these guys, and there's some girls too, are able to do to manufacture, like you say, that celebrity to get people to be so invested within, within them and what they're saying? Yeah. So, you know, you can't do anything in business without eyeballs, right? You got to have eyeballs. And then, and then the eyeballs uh, create opportunity. And so there are a lot of people that aren't ethical that uh, manufacture celebrity and cannot back it up when that well, manufacture celebrity. When I say this celebrity is eyeballs, people know you, they, 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 you know, there's a lot of people more that know you than don't. And, and it gives an opportunity to open up a door so that you can take advantage of them, provide value to them, help them change their life or take, you know, like I said, take advantage of them. So, but that's what celebrity does. Then you, the next step is, okay, what am I going to do for people? What's my mission? And so, yeah, there are a lot of scammers out there. There's a lot of people that know the game of manufacturing celebrity. Um, and then there's a lot of people that are labeled scammers because the people that are calling them scammers are, are scammers themselves. And then right. they have this thing inside of them that they're, they're, they, they take advantage of people. So they think everybody else is going to take advantage of them. And so I have a lot of friends in the industry uh, that get called scammer, but I've, they've helped me big time. And, and, and the things that people do that are really ethical out there that have become a celebrity in the space that offer value, the stuff that they tell you only works if you work. Right. And so, yeah, I mean, I think that's the case. And, uh, I think that you gotta be really careful when you're, when you're judging other people. And I, and I think it's a time for reflection to look inside yourself and see what kind of things are bringing that thought up. Sure. So, I mean, really, when you're thinking about these people, you got to think like, what are they made of? And that leads to you with your podcast, 
what went into you deciding to launch the What Are You Made Of podcast where you're focusing on personal development and entrepreneurship? And how have you been able to, to kind of grow that brand? It's a very fascinating uh, podcast, a great concept. Uh, and what what are some of the, the notable guests you've had on or, or stories that you perhaps seem to hear on your podcast that maybe are a trend? And all these people who have the same type of successes, they all have this same type of uh, background, et cetera. Uh, well, to answer your question, uh, and I'll get into how this all came about too, but the guests that I have, I mean, you know, I, I interviewed right now, I'm focused on a lot of impact driven podcast hosts that have top podcasts because I want to build a network of podcast hosts to share my network with. But when I first started, it was a show that I wanted to inspire people to that, to remind them that they're unstoppable to live in the life of their dreams and really showcase and expose a lot of vulnerability in people that had success, a lot of transparency and bring these behind the scenes uh, experiences to light. Because I think that we all go through tough times. You know, we all go through difficulties. We all go through sleepless nights or waking up not, like thinking like, what am I going to do next? When's the next sale coming or whatever? How's this business going to work? Getting screwed over and, and, and feeling like a victim. And we go, all of us go through it. And when we're going through it, a couple things I, I noticed with this, it feels permanent. When you're in the midst of an adversity, there's very little light at the end of the tunnel, if any, little hope. Uh, you know, you feel like all alone in it. And you feel like you're watching other people that are succeeding. You're really thinking that they don't go through the same things or haven't been through the same things. So what are you made of? The name came from me talking to myself a lot because I always ask that question. What are you made of, man? Come on, look at all the stuff you've been through as a kid. You know, I came from a lot of brokenness. And I remind myself of the things that I went through that still got through it. And what, what, what did that do to me? What did it do for me? I'm thankful for all the tough times and the brokenness I came from. Instead of looking at it as like, oh, this is what happened to me. And I'm looking at like, man, this is, this is what built me. And so what are you made of came from that. And that's the question I start the show with every time is what are you made of? And it, people have an opportunity to, to reflect upon that. And uh, the show, you know, I've done on probably close to 800 episodes now. And the, the common theme I see from people is, is that they've all been through whatever they've been through and they got through it because they wouldn't be on the show with me if they hadn't gotten through it. So I like to remind people of that if you're on the show, you've gotten through everything you've ever been through. Now it's time to share the story to remind other people of that to keep going. And so uh, that's how that started. And I mean, I've had guests from movie producers, actors, celebrities, to entrepreneurs, to authors, to people on the come up, like all a uh, wide range of people, man. But there is a common thread of everybody's been through something or some things, man. Yeah, I could relate to the uh, the growing up in the brokenness part. But what it teaches you is, first and foremost, you know, unfortunately, you got to look within, right, to deal with those challenges. Um, but it, it adds some moxie to you. You know, you know it, it really allows you to build the foundation that you want within yourself, uh, what you want for your life, more so than what other people want for your life, right? So that's something that... Um, I think from my experiences, that's what I took away from it over the years. Uh, I relate to you a lot, you know, right down to the, uh, the cross. Yeah. The let's exposed go. cross, right? Hey, you guys yeah, didn't I, get me in, the, put me in on the memo for the black t-shirt. I want the white. <laughs> I'm Joe's wearing maroon, but it looks I'm wearing, like... yeah, I'm, I usually wear black, believe it or not. I was going to wear a black shirt, but something told me to wear maroon. So it's a good thing we didn't totally match. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so uh, you had your podcast, you wrote your book, right? So the book, the premise of the book is uh, similar concepts that we're talking about right now. Uh, Rocket Fuel, Convert Setbacks, Become Unstoppable. Uh, you actually published the book on April 27, 2021. That's what I see on Amazon. Another synchronicity is I had a childhood friend who I grew up with, died unexpectedly in a freak motorcycle accident. His birthday was April 27, 1991. So wow. uh, just another synchronicity there. And again, Nick, it's written in the stars. Um, but in terms of writing a book, right, uh, did any particular person or, or a publisher uh, with your increasing uh, kind of notoriety here approach you about writing the book? Or was it just something that was on the checklist uh, for things that you wanted to just to do in your life accomplish? Um, and was the process difficult? You know, I know the, I know the book's not too, too long, uh, but just to sit down, gather your thoughts, writing it out, setting the sign to do it. Um, so was that difficult in any way? Well well, yeah, it was difficult going through the past things that I went through and addressing those and confronting those issues. 
uh, nobody came to me about a book and I didn't really ever think about being an author. Uh, but I just, when I was doing the studying of manufacturing celebrity and watching what other people do, I looked at it as an opportunity, another way to get the message out and build, build some kind of value and brand. So that's what I did. I started to build it. And I said, while I was writing it that, uh, cause I was being mentored by Grant Cardone at the time. And, uh, I said, I'm going to get Grant to write this forward for this book. Before I even wrote it, I told the team as we were getting together to write it, I said, here's two things we're going to do. We're going to be a bestseller and we're going to get Grant Cardone to write this forward. Now, I had no idea he never wrote a forward for a book before, and I didn't even know if he would even do it, but I just committed it. Again, I had no idea how to do it. And when I wrote the book, while we were getting a team, I said, this is how we're going to move forward. And if anybody's in misalignment with what I just said, we're not, you're not going to be on the team. Everything that we do has to be in alignment with those two things. And we're going to get this story out. And, uh, you know, going through writing the book, yeah, it was tough, man, because I'm thinking about the people that I'm sharing stories from and the, the abuse and things that I went through as a kid and, you know, thinking about, should I, should I share this stuff? And I, I didn't put any names in the book as far as, uh, you know, anybody that was involved with any of that stuff, but I did talk about it and there was some, definitely some blowback from the family, um, about doing it. But I, I felt like years had gone past enough years had gone past 30 years or so. And I figured it was more important to inspire and help people with some of the things I learned from, uh, from those experiences and my going through those and then coming out on the other side. And so, yeah, um, that's it. So building off the book and, you know, educating people or sharing your story, you have a few companies now outside of the mortgage world. So founder, CEO of people building founder, uh, that one agency, which you do the guest booking and personal branding stuff. What is your ultimate goal with these companies and how do you and your team identify the right types of people that you want to work with or the right types of companies you want to work with? Because I'm sure you're not necessarily just saying yes to everything. You said it earlier, you got to, you're at that point where you, you got to decide yes or no. So how do you go about factoring into those decisions of who you want to work with? Well, the vision for these companies, when I started this brand, that one, well, people building is like a, a, a the, the head company of everything, right? And everything right. filters into that. But because uh, I'm a people builder at heart. But when I created the brand that one, I wanted to create a brand that could be placed on many different verticals or industries, not just one. And it didn't matter what it started out with, but it can be placed in numerous ways on whatever. And that one comes down to really identifying, this is an exercise I did for myself that really helped me, is identifying who I am. Like who, who am I? And like identifying all the quirkiness, the weirdness, the, the things that set me apart from make me different. And not running from that, leaning into it unapologetically and becoming that one. And that is something that everybody should be focused on and doing because what it does is it separates you from everyone else. You don't blend in. I don't want to blend in. I want to be different. I want to be that person, that one that, that you know, when people run into me, meet me, know me, hear about me, that they're, they're, they, they, it's different. You know, it's not like everybody else. And so you don't have to be the best. You know, you got to be different so that people know you and, and you're, you stand out. And that's, that's what I focused on. And so the mission, the vision now is to find different verticals to add uh, this, this brand to that, that align with that, that brand that I created. And so now, you know, the booking, we, we get people on top ranked podcasts, book them with uh, warm connections and then really emphasize the relationship part of that and podcasting. Podcasting changed my life. I've been on over 1,100 shows as a guest, and I figured out some things with it. And then, and then from here, I'm starting a tour, that one mastermind podcast tour. I'm going around to different cities, LA next week, and interviewing celebrities, um, and then bringing people that aren't celebrities in to be interviewed and be in that environment so that it gives them proximity, because I believe elevation comes from proximity. And uh, we're going to build revenue for that, through that for those people that want access to that. It's not for everybody. And uh, I, again, when I decided to do this tour, I really had no idea what the hell I was doing. I mean, some things I knew, but I, I just commit and we figure it out. And so, you know, the idea for me is like, I write this down in, 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 in my journal. I write this down that uh, that one became a billion dollar brand. I have no, fellas, I have no idea what that looks like. Like, I really don't. Like, if I put it down, it, it may not be what I put down, but I just know that what I've created here is something that can really be something. And, uh, yeah, well, it's yet to be seen what happens, but I'm just 47 years old right now. I, I feel like I have a long life ahead of me and I want to commit to this now, this brand and surround myself with great people that 
kind of see the vision and want to jump on board. Yeah, what Nick and I have going on here, um, two things. Number one, uh, we always bring it up to other people all the time. You know, we feel like eventually what we do is a, it's significant and it would be a strong uh, touring act kind of a way, you know, to open up for other people that we know uh, who are other types of entertainers to do interviews. So that's something that we've always kind of wanted to do uh, as well, um, that you're in the process of getting off the ground. Uh, and, and also uh, we've already been able to, to book you, you know, we would love to have other people within your close network um, on our show in the future. Uh, Nick and I are always welcome to do other opportunities to be on other shows. Uh, so I think that's something that I, I think, the three of us can work towards uh, an immediate uh, future, which would be really, really nice. But I want to talk about uh, helping people stand out for a second, because uh, there are a lot of people out there uh, who are innately talented, um, who have certain skill sets to show, uh, but some of those people are, are not so well connected, right? Uh, so personally speaking, from where you started to where you are now, uh, what would you give somebody out there uh, tips uh, to improve their networking and social media skills uh, to monetize whatever type of brand, you know, that he or she is building kind of immediately uh, in the, the, the short term. Uh, and what have you noticed specifically that works for you the most? Uh, well, first of all, people need to, like I said, identify who they are and really be authentic to that. Because when I go out to meet people, I don't want people to be di like disappointed when they meet me in person. I get, I get two things all the time when people meet me in person. Oh, you're a lot you know, uh, shorter than I thought you were. That's number one. I'm 5'7", but I guess I have a big personality and a big beingness. I feel like I could fill up a city with my beingness. But when I meet me in person, I got it. But, but I don't want them to be disappointed. You know, I want to be authentic uh, online, digitally. I think people, it's important. And I can't be authentic unless I know who I am. And I'm comfortable with that and, and, and lean into it unapologetically. Uh, the other thing that people say to me is when my wife's with me, they're like, that's your wife. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, what do you mean? <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, uh, all joking aside, really identifying who you are, leaning into it unapologetically, being authentic, and then show up places, put yourself places where people are that you want to hang around. And so, you know, I, I'll give you an example. I was at the Aspire tour up in New York city uh, about a month ago and I brought my wife up there and there was people all over the place. Now I connected with the founders first and, and built some, you know, a little bit of relationship with them ahead of time. But then when I got there, there's other people there that are trying to do the same thing. They want to be around this attention that the Inspire Tour is creating, which is phenomenal. I love what they're doing. Uh, shout out to Andrew, Eddie, and uh, Dan Fleischman. Um, but, but the thing is, is that I met a guy there that I'd been connecting with on Instagram. And his name's Adam. And he was there talking to Dan Fleischman. And I walked up and I was like, yeah, Adam, I've been, you know, net, you know, reaching out to your DM. We've been talking a little bit, but I really wanted to meet you. And it's just funny how we, again, Joe, we just happened to connect. We just happened to be there at the same time after I was DMing him. And uh, you should have told me in advance. I was there as well. I didn't go to the you? event, but I was there outside after. Yeah. Uh, yeah Dave, Mel Dave Meltz is a very good friend of mine. My okay. Dave. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He was there too. And, uh, but you know, the, the point is, is that Adam said to me, he's like, what are you doing after this? I'm like, well, we're heading out. He's like, well, yeah, we got to get dinner together. And I said, well, I live in Ocean City. Uh, I'll come back to New York anytime. And he said, no, 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 I'll fly down to Ocean City. And, and this gentleman's, you know, well off. Like, I don't know if he's a billionaire. He's somewhere up there, man. He's very well off, well connected. But the point is, is I'm authentic. And when I showed up, I was the same person I was online. And I showed up. I showed up as myself. And so I think that's very important for people to do. And that doesn't happen unless you're committed. You know, you got to be committed. To, to whatever you're trying to build. I'm, I'm committed, man. And, and, and I, when you commit, this is why people don't continue on their commitment. You know, they, they get committed to something and then they share it with their surroundings, their current environment, which is not an environment that's going to really be conducive to where they want to go. And the people around them are thinking differently and they resonate differently. The energy is not the same. And they get basically talked out of it. They're, they're sharing their dream and commitment to people looking for a license to be successful from those people. You know, you got to get a license to drive. You got to get a license to be a mortgage person, real estate agent, to, to actually do business. People have this thing in their head that they have to have a license to be successful. And they need that validation and that license handed to them by the people in their environment, which are really the people that are really dangerous to them that are stealing their dreams from them subconsciously. And so, you know, I think it's important. There's a, there's a lot to talk about here. 
But I, I mean, I think that commitment is imperative and commitment means you're committed all out and you're not going to let somebody talk you out of it. And then showing up once you know who you are authentically. Absolutely. And I know it's hard sometimes to you know, turn off the work brain and social media when you go on the podcast, but do you allow yourself to kind of ever just like, you know, sit back a little, maybe pick up a hobby, watch some reality TV? Uh, what what do you what do you do as far as like any sort of minimal downtime you have? So when I got out of the mortgage business, it was a time of I got to find stabilization. So at that time, I took off. I'm a golfer. Hmm. I love golf. I, I used to golf three times a week. Wow. And uh, it took uh, our first phone call on the golf course, by the way. Just want to let you oh, know. yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> And so I hated the fact that I gave up golf for two years. I, I, I stopped hanging around the fellas and which was a great connection opportunity for me and a great escape for me. And, but I had to do that to stabilize. Like you, when I was talking about before, when something happens, you know, I got a family to take care of bills to pay. I got to stabilize. I got to figure something out. Once I figured that out and I stabilized and then I can be in this position now where I'm building and optimizing I go back to those things because they're very important. You have to be able to let your hair down. You have to be able to free yourself up. And so golf is something that I got back into. And um, I'm happy that I did because uh, my daughter loves golf now. She's 12. And one other thing I did, fellas, is I took my daughter out of school, public school, because for a couple of reasons. Number one, I, I don't believe in, I'm not aligned with it. Um, but the other reason was I wanted to spend more time with her because my son's just graduated. He's 18 and it went so fast. And I feel like I've missed so many opportunities to do more with him. And now I have an opportunity. So ways that I escape is, you know, I hang out with my daughter. She homeschools. I, who's better to teach her than me. And, and we, in the mornings, we focus on training and, and getting our mind right and our bodies right together. We go to the golf course in the evenings. Um, we hit balls. We have deep conversations. And my, my focus now is to build this brand to help people and do what I want to do there. And then make sure my daughter has every opportunity of that if she wants to be, you know, the greatest golfer on the planet, go to school and maybe go pro with it, that I give her every opportunity to do so. Um, but more importantly, develop her into the, the, the most amazing person she could possibly be. So. That's awesome. Who would be your dream foursome for golf? What are the three people going to be golfing with you? Man. Um, you know, I haven't played golf with a lot of these guys, but like Tiger and all that, I've been around them on the golf course. John Daly and all these guys. I think, you know, I really think it would be cool. I don't know, man. It's a good question. I think John Daly would be awesome. <laughs> yeah, it would, it would be a good time. I mean, I could say John and, and Tiger and, and uh, you know, some of the golfers now that I like to watch, you know, uh, uh, Bryson DeChambeau and Rory McIlroy and all those. But, um, yeah, I guess, I guess it would be probably PGA golfers probably or an LPGA player or something like that just because of their skill level and I want to be around good good people. Cause I think it elevates, uh, my ability. I, I, I don't mind hanging out with people, but I don't want to really want to play golf with people that are just learning it or not hitting the ball. Um, at least at my level, because it kind of, to me, if I'm on a golf course, I want to, I want to challenge and I want to, you know, so I think it's, it had, it had to be those guys. Fair enough. So in your life for your career, what would you say has been your, you know, all right moment. What I mean by that, it's a time or place where you wanted to pursue something. You ask somebody for advice, they're like, Mike, that's not going to work out. What are you, crazy? Why would you do that? And you were like, you know what? I'm going to do it anyway. And in the end, you will see why it is that I'm right about this. Well, it's when I decided I was in the mortgage business and when I decided to start building a personal brand, I had people thinking I was crazy. And and like I, the people closest to me making comments, throwing digs. And I just said, watch. Like, you know, I'm not, I basically, every time somebody did that, I used it as, in, I didn't need a license from them. And I'm going to show you, I added it like, okay, that means I got to push the pedal down harder, not pull off of it. And so that was it, man, really building the brand. And, and then, you know, here's the thing, guys, when I started doing this and I know you guys have had experience with this, I started getting around people that everybody knows, right. Having them on my show, networking, going to events and somebody would be there. And I was like, holy cow, can you believe I just hung out with so-and-so? And I have a long list of that now. And then I would go back all the time and tell the people that say, said those things and say, hey, do you know who I had on the show today? Hey, I was out in LA hanging out with so-and-so. And, -so. and I, I got their number now. I'm friends with them on this and that. And they would not ever celebrate. They and I would be so pissed too because I would be like, I let it piss me off a little bit because I'd be like, man, I, I support my friends. I want them yeah. to be successful. I, I don't guess. hate on it. Right? And, and I couldn't believe that everybody would be just like, oh yeah, really? Okay, that's cool. 
You know what I mean? And it was like no big deal to them. And so I, I have to say is when, the, when I started building the personal brand and getting out there more and hanging out in these different places, man, I think that's got to be the moment. Yeah. Unfortunately, over time, uh, you do realize who is right for you in your current environment, who is not right for you in your current environment. Uh, but well said, you know, certainly Nick and I have a couple of st uh, stories like that uh, that we can share as well with you over time. Uh, last thing here before we let you go. Uh, I recently passed my New York State real estate exam. So I'm in Congrats, the process man. of transitioning and, and working my way into that. Uh, so would love to use you. Um, and the people that you are surrounded with as resources in the future. Um, Nick and I would love, absolutely love to stay in touch. This sure. was amazing. We thank you for your time. We really, really appreciate it. Uh, we know you have presences all over social media. Uh, so if there's anything else you would personally like to share uh, or promote for yourself, uh, by all means, go ahead. Uh, we always give our guests here the last words. And Mike Sirock, we appreciate your time and we thank you again, pal. Thank you, Nick. Joe, appreciate you guys and all your listeners too. Thank you for paying attention. Uh, to me, it's, uh, it's amazing that uh, people, you know, invest time and attention into anything that I'm doing. So I'm very grateful and thankful for that. And, uh, you know, yeah, Instagram's the best place to connect with me. I love my DMs. I, I DM like crazy. That's actually how Joe and I met. I DM Joe out of the blue. And uh, I don't know yeah. what you thought at first. Like, what's this dude DM me for? But I'm authentic, genuinely trying to connect with people. How wait, How did you stumble on me? Was it just a real showed up? That's that's what I'm curious about. Yeah. So what I do, I'm a, I'm on Instagram, uh, not as a consumer. I'm a I'm on there hyper intentional, looking for impact driven people to connect with. And so when I see one, I don't even think twice. I just reach out. I'd shoot it, shoot a DM. Hey, love your content. Would love to connect sometime. Explore synergy. Um, I have a great show. We can talk about podcasting, whatever, but like, I definitely want to just hop on a 15 minute call with you. And you'd be surprised the people that answer it from people on the come up to, to amazing people, billionaires, celebrities, they answer. And uh, so, yeah. And so if anybody's listening, wants to connect with me, DM me, um, you can check out the links that we have on Instagram. That one agency's on there. If you want to get on podcasts or be a part of the tour that we're doing, the podcast tour and mastermind, that's it right now, fellas. Well, this has been great, Mike. Thank you for your time. That's going to do it here for this episode of You Know I'm Right. For our very special guest, C-Rock, my co-host, Joey Cows. I'm Nick. Yes, the ultimate nickname, Nick. And this has been You Know I'm Right.